I'll just start with the uh, go, go to the next slide. Great. Um, so I I wanted to just emphasize that sort of mapping out the dark matter halo in the Milky Way is um, it's a it's a vast undertaking, and there's there's a, a huge number, a very large number of studies focusing on this. Um, the work that I'm going to be um, uh, talking to you about today is really going to be concentrating on how we can create a map of the dark matter halo uh, near the position of the sun. And there's a couple of reasons that um, I'm going to be focusing on that. One is that a lot of the new data that's been coming online through the Gaia satellite is really sort of focused on that area. Um, the second has to do with um, an experimental motivation, which is that many of the uh, ground-based terrestrial searches for dark matter are going to be sensitive precisely to that dark matter map that's near the solar position. So experiments like uh, the Xenon um, 100 ton scale experiments um, are essentially looking for dark matter particles in like astrophysical dark matter particles in the halo that fly through the Earth, end up hitting a target um, in the detector that's usually deep underground in a mine or, or under a mountain. And um, the dark matter particle you would never directly see, but you could potentially see it, um, its uh, recoil effect on a nucleus or an electron uh, that it collides with inside the detector. So these kinds of experiments are ultra sensitive and looking for these sort of small jiggles that you might see uh, in the, the target material that come from a collision with the dark matter particle. Um, and in interpreting the results from these kinds of experiments, you need to have a face space map of the dark matter halo in order to predict what the scattering rate should be in the experiment. So this means that you need to know both the local number density of the dark matter, so that's, that would obviously be related to its local density, um, but also its velocity distribution near the sun. And uh, both of these points have been appreciated really since the very beginning of when uh, the first proposals for these kinds of terrestrial direct detection experiments were put forward in the 1980s. Uh, next slide. Um, so like one of the uh, you know, first papers on this by Drucker, Fries, and Spurgel uh, recognized the fact that uh, interpreting the results from these kinds of experiments would rely on knowing information about the dark matter halo and so they had to posit a model that could be used um, for, uh, you know, by experimentalists in interpreting their results. Um, and the model that was posited at that time was sort of very simple um, and is outlined on this slide. It treats the dark matter as a collisionless fluid, um, and you assume that the fluid mass is conserved. Uh, you also assume that the dark matter is in steady state that its velocities are isotropic, and that you end up getting um, a flat rotation curve. Um, so that would essentially be making sure that your theory, your model is consistent with the observations, the flat rotation curve. And when you combine these sets of assumptions, um, it, it's actually quite simple to end up getting a prediction that the dark matter density locally should follow uh, an isothermal profile, so going as one over R squared, and that its velocity distribution should be a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And uh, these are essentially the assumptions that are used um, in all analyses of, uh, they're sort of standard assumptions that are used in the analyses of direct detection experiments. So if you ever end up seeing a, a limit plot from one of these experiments, um, boiled into that limit line is essentially this, this model of the local dark matter. Um, and because it's become sort of the paradigm for what everybody uses, uh, for interpretations, it's referred to as the standard halo model. Uh, next slide. We have an opportunity now to revisit this model and ask uh, how accurate is it? Um, is it consistent with the actual data? Um, and so we can revisit like specific assumptions that go into that model. So for example, the fact, you know, the assumption that the local dark matter is in steady state. Uh, what does that actually mean in practice? Um, that's actually a statement on the uh, historical evolution of the Milky Way galaxy itself. So let's think about how the, milk, the dark matter near the sun actually got here. Um, it got here through a process in which our galaxy uh, grew by um, accreting other smaller galaxies. 
So this happens over the process of many giga years. Uh, and um, you know, there's a, you know, a variety of possibilities for how this can happen. So for example, on the left here is a scenario where uh, the, his the history of how the Milky Way evolved would be pretty quiet. So early on, you might have two smaller galaxies that merge together and then just kind of sat there in isolation for a long time until you get you know, the galaxy, our Milky Way today. And you can contrast that with a much more active history where you have a bunch of small galaxies constantly merging um, with, our, with our own up until the point of the present day. And so in, when we make the assumption that the local dark matter is in equilibrium, that it's in a steady state, we're really saying that the merger history of the Milky Way is the scenario on the left. Um, that's one where the system has had enough time to come into equilibrium after the initial merger happened many, many years ago. Um, and so we have an opportunity now to essentially test this hypothesis because uh, data from the Gaia uh, satellite and, um, you know, in upcoming years from Roman and DES are all shedding light on the merger history of the Milky Way. And so they're giving us an actual picture of what this family tree should look like. And we can use that, therefore, to sort of understand how the dark matter near the sun is actually behaving and whether or not we, we get something that's, that's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or whether or not it's different. Uh, next slide. So over the course of the talk, I'm going to start in the first half um, just kind of walking through this process in a bit more detail, sort of what happens when one of these smaller satellite galaxies um, merges with the Milky Way, gets disrupted, gets ultimately eaten up by our galaxy. So that's why it's referred to as cannibalism. And I want to talk in that um, about what's happening to the dark matter throughout that whole process. And the first part of the talk will rely heavily on results from simulation. Then in the second part, I'll talk about um, recent results with uh, data from the Gaia satellite, what we've actually been learning directly from the data about what's going on in this merger history and how we can tie that in with uh, our understanding of the dark matter distribution. Uh, next slide. Um, so this was supposed to be a movie, which uh, is not. So I'll tell you what this was supposed to show. Um, this was a, a movie of a galaxy from the fire simulation, from a fire simulation. So fire is um, a hydrodynamic cosmological simulation. Uh, it's a fire stands for feedback in realistic environments. And um, this particular uh, movie I was gonna show focuses on a galaxy that's similar to the Milky Way. Um, it starts at a very early redshift, so redshift of 10. And you can see how the Milky Way in, grows by the merger of all of these smaller satellite galaxies. phase, things are sort of very uh, uh, chaotic, the collisions are very violent, but as time proceeds, um, you end up seeing that uh, the collisions, the sort of galaxies that are merging become smaller. Um, that allows for a, a stable stellar disk to form in the center part of the Milky Way, and um, you ultimately end up getting something that looks like the galaxy that, that we see today. Um, next slide. 
Uh, so let's kind of walk through this step by step. So starting from uh, a host galaxy, which we'll assume is sort of roughly the size of the Milky Way, and that's uh, illustrated here by that that primary stellar disk in the in the center. And we'll imagine that there's some smaller satellite galaxy that's falling in. Um, as that smaller satellite galaxy falls in, there's a variety of stages through which it's going to get disrupted. So in the initial stages, um, tidal forces start stripping dark matter and stars from the satellite galaxy, and that dark matter and stars uh, essentially end up getting left behind along, roughly along the orbital path of the galaxy. Um, so the, in this stage, the material that's left behind is very coherent, um, both spatially and then also uh, in velocity. So spatially, it really looks like a, a narrow stream. And if you look at the stars and the dark matter in that stream, it's, they're fairly coherent. Um, next slide. Um, a, a large number of these stellar streams have actually been observed in the Milky Way, which has been a, uh, it's a beautiful sort of uh, representation of you know, this process all at work. Um, and this movie uh, would have shown you um, the stellar stream that forms uh, from the merger of the Sagittarius galaxy, which is happening uh, currently. So Sagittarius is actually in the process of being disrupted. And um, we see uh, uh, stars that actually tra trace out the orbital path of Sagittarius. stars that actually tra trace out the orbital path of Sagittarius. It's perhaps one of the most spectacular streams that, that have been observed in our galaxy. Um, next slide. Uh, so in the fire simulation, um, we can actually go in and identify a uh, um, substructure that's removed that actually looks like stellar streams. So we can identify stellar streams and then look to see uh, whether or not there's a corresponding dark matter stream um, that's uh, coming from the same galaxy. And so we can compare, does the dark matter stream really track where the stellar stream is? Do they have the same velocities um, and so forth? And what we learned from this exercise is that in general, um, if you do form a stellar stream, very often you also have a corresponding dark matter stream but the two aren't always necessarily directly aligned with each other. And moreover, there could be small differences in their, their speed distributions. Um, so this is illustrated for a particular example on this plot here, which is just showing a, a distribution in speeds for um, a, a stellar stream that's in pink and its corresponding dark matter stream in blue. So the, the velocities in both streams are similar to each other, but they aren't in direct uh, correspondence. Uh, next slide. So if we continue now with uh, sort of moving forward in the evolution of this merger, um, once that satellite galaxy makes many orbits, um, all of these streams are essentially getting wound up. And you can think of this almost as sort of like winding up a ball of yarn. Um, after a certain point, you sort of lose the coherence of any individual stream and you just sort of see the material that's gotten removed as kind of a big fluffy cloud of stuff. So spatially, um, everything gets mixed. But uh, what's interesting is that in velocity space, that cloud of stuff actually ends up having um, very distinctive and in some cases, uh, uh, coherent features in the velocity distribution of the material. And that's important because it means that even though spatially, like there's nothing interesting going on, we can actually look for, um, you know, distinctive velocity behavior to identify uh, the fact that this material got left behind by a satellite galaxy. Um, next slide. Um, so again, if we go into the fire simulation and identify a merger um, that sort of came in not so recently, so one that essentially had an opportunity to make many of these orbital passes. And then we can look at the 
both the stellar material and dark matter material that it left behind, um, what we find in this case is that indeed, uh, both the stars and the dark matter sort of spatially don't really, they look sort of like fluffy clouds. There's nothing interesting going on there. But when we zoom in and we look at their velocity behavior, um, oftentimes you end up seeing like uh, bimodal distributions, um, interesting shapes there that um, are reflective of the orbital properties of that merging galaxy. And moreover, for these particular instances, because the material is more well mixed, both the dark matter and the stellar velocity distributions track each other really well. Um, so this is interesting and really heartening because it suggests that if we do find evidence for one of these older mergers in the Gaia data, that the velocity di distribution of the stars that would have originated from that merger um, would, would track nicely and be a, a good indicator for the dark matter that would have also gotten left behind by that merger. Um, and again, all of the statements that I'm making here are specific to the solar neighborhood. Next slide. So the, the last stage of this evolution is mergers that came in very, very uh, early on. And so this is these are mergers that have left behind stars and dark matter in the Milky Way. And the stars and dark matter have had tons of time, essentially, to uh, come into equilibrium and to, uh, to, to virialize by the present day. And so if we go into the fire simulations and we look at only these very old mergers, and these are typically galaxies that came in um, before redshift of three or so, and we look to see what how their dark matter and stars are behaving today, what we find is that um, the velocity distribution is usually isotropic. It does look sort of maxwell boltzmann um, and that the dark matter and the stars from these really old mergers track each other um, almost perfectly. So um, uh, yeah, so this allows us then to also, uh, this also suggests that the uh, accreted stars can serve as a good tracer for some of the uh, dark matter that would have come from these oldest mergers. Next slide. Um, okay, so this is just a summary now of how we've been thinking of uh, sort of the process by which you would sort of create a map of the dark matter near the solar position. Um, with an understanding of what the merger history of the galaxy is. Uh, so the ultimate goal, right, is to create that map. And the way we're thinking of doing that is essentially by understanding which satellite galaxies would have contributed material near the solar position. Of those satellite galaxies, we're dividing them in two separate categories. So the ones that are large enough to actually be luminous and have enough stars in them, and then the ones that are less massive and don't have any stars in them. So these would be like dark galaxies. Um, and uh, where we've been you know, making the most progress to date is essentially on the arm of this diagram for the luminous satellite galaxies. So that's the arm where we can use the stars that would have also been removed from those galaxies to learn something about the underlying dark matter that would have come from those galaxies. And so we can use these stellar tracers to identify these mergers, um, determine whether or not the mergers were very old, not so recent, or came in very recently. And then based off of that, um, uh, understand what the underlying, like how the underlying dark matter distribution should be behaving. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe like five or so years ago, we really had no understanding of how to do this mapping of the local dark matter. And I think with the advent of Gaia and also combining all of that with what we've been learning from simulations, we've been able to make a lot of progress on get understanding that local dark matter piece from coming from the luminous satellite galaxies. Uh, where we uh, haven't quite dug in yet, but this is definitely uh, future work, is understanding how to also build up the component that's coming from the dark galaxies. Um, but for the rest of the talk, I'm going to really be focusing on the advancements we've made um, from coming from the dark matter that originated from these luminous satellites. Next slide. Okay, so that leads me to the second part of the talk, um, focusing on, this is going to be more focused on actually the Gaia data and what we've been learning about the Milky Way's uh, historical evolution and how we tie that in to the, um, to the dark, local dark matter distribution. Next slide. So Gaia is the follow-up astrometric survey to Hipparchos, which ran in the early 1990s. 
It was launched in December 2013. The second data release was a few years ago, and um, the community is ramping up and getting really excited because the third data release is coming um, this, this June. Um, the advancement from Gaia that Gaia has made from Hipparchos is tremendous. It provides measurements for over a billion stars in the galaxy, which is about 1% of the Milky Way stars. This is far more than we've ever um, been able to sample. Uh, next slide. And just to kind of give you a quick sense for um, that, that sort of scale of the difference, the, um, this is the, the Milky Way galaxy, but rotated up. So going vertical is the, the disk and the sun is in the bottom. The little dotted line, dotted circle around the sun is uh, the region where Hipparchos was able to measure stellar distances with an accuracy of 10%. Um, and the corresponding region where Gaia has that same level of precision is shown by the, um, the next outer circle. So um, with Gaia, we can get this mapping that goes out much, much further. Um, so it's a, it's a spectacular opportunity to be able to look for uh, material that would have gotten left behind by um, these accreted satellites. Um, next slide. So what is actually the plot? Like, how does one do this? Um, it's challenging because most of the stars in the Gaia data are actually stars that were born in the Milky Way and are forming the Milky Way's stellar disk. So in trying to find stars that would have come from a merging galaxy, it's really a um, it's, a, it's a rare event search, essentially. Um, and so in order to do this effectively, um, it, it's a bit like going on an archaeological dig. So if on an archaeological dig, you might find a fossil, and then you would use something about the shape of the fossil, maybe its environment, maybe you might do some radioactive dating to try to figure out the creature that it came from and, and when that creature might have lived. Um, in a similar way, um, we can go into the Gaia data and use information about stellar positions, their velocities, and perhaps their chemical abundance to try to infer the sort of satellite, the galaxy from which it came, and to infer the sort of full picture of the evolution of that satellite galaxy. Next slide. Uh, there's been a vast effort on this over the last few years. Um, and the you know the galaxies that have you know a variety of these galaxies have been uh, mergers have been um, hypothesized and uh, based off of the data. Um, this is just a really sort of I think it's a sort of very nice way of illustrating this. So I thought I'd include this. Um, so this is kind of a mapping um, going back in time. So present day would be at the bottom, and then as you go into the further into the past of the Milky Way, that's you're moving up, and um, the arrows, the, the black lines are indicating um, time points when we think that one of these mergers might have happened. So there's the Sagittarius galaxy, um, which I mentioned earlier, that we actually see in the process of falling in and being disrupted. Um, you know, that likely started that process, um, you know, maybe like six or so giga years ago. And then as you work backwards, there's other galaxies that have been um, other merging events that have been identified. Another one that I'll spend quite a bit talk quite a bit talking about later is this Gaia and Philatus merger, which um, is hypothesized to have occurred sometime between eight to ten giga years ago. Uh, next slide. Um, this is another way of kind of looking at the same picture. So um, the way people identify that these mergers occurred is by looking for patterns in the kinematics or uh, energy and angular momentum distribution of the stars. So this is a uh, work um, from the H3 survey. And on the left panel, you see uh, total energy as a function of angular momentum in the Z direction. Each dot represents a star in this space. And you know it sort of looks like a big blob of stuff, but there's actually a lot of structure that's there. And all of the work sort of goes into figuring out how to actually divide that up into, you know, structures that make sense. And on the right is is a, a very sort of uh, illustrative mapping of uh, where particular clusters are thought to, to be. And um, in some case, those clusters uh, might be associated with a with a particular uh, satellite merger. Uh, next slide. So. Our goal for the sort of rest of the talk is to essentially go through this exercise, but focusing really on the region around where the sun is. So, um, which I've indicated here by this white box, um, 
this is a particularly difficult region to do this exercise in um, because you have a huge amount of contamination from stars that um, were born in situ, or, or that's just another way of saying that they were born in the Milky Way in, the, in its stellar disk. So you essentially, you have to be able to sift through all of that in order to be able to identify the, you know, maybe 1% of those stars that might have originated in a galaxy merger. But this is essentially the effort that we need to go through if we want to really understand um, what satellite mergers dumped things near the sun. Because um, if we can map that out for, from the stars, we can then try to infer um, what that would have done to the dark matter near the sun. Uh, next slide. So a very traditional way of doing these kinds of searches is to try to figure out how to separate out the stars that would have been born in the Milky Way's disk from those that would have come in from a merger by sort of slicing in particular regions of parameter space where you'd think that the disk stars should be separated from the merger stars. Um, so this is very illustrative, but it's just a little cartoon thing, but just to kind of show how this would work in particular along particular parameters. So on the left is um, a plot, a little schematic plot of uh, circular velocity of the stars. So this would be their um, orbital velocity around the center of the galaxy. And uh, vertical axis is their, um, their metallicity, um, which you can think of as a proxy for the age of the stars with the age increasing as you go down the, the y-axis. So the stars that were born in the Milky Way would sort of cluster up in the top right of that where the ages of the stars would be um, pretty young. And then they would all be sort of rotating around um, with roughly 200 kilometers a second circular velocity. And stars from uh, mergers uh, don't necessarily have to follow this pattern. They'll typically be older, so they'll fall lower in down on this plane, and their velocities um, might have more of a spread. They may not necessarily be moving around with 200 kilometers a second. So, um, so one way to you know sort of slice out the disk stars is to just put a cut and remove everything that's uh, you know from the right top region of the plot. Um, next slide. Um, our approach for the results I'm going to show you next is a bit different. Um, what we wanted to be able to do was to see if we could train a neural network to better distinguish stars that would have been born in situ, so disk stars, from those that would have come from these merging satellite galaxies. Um, this is a classification problem. Um, and uh, what this was a little animated movie just showing a um, cartoon of a neural network where you train in on a bunch of labeled photographs of cats and dogs and um, you know, the, the network then ends up learn, learning how to classify photos that look like a cat and photos that look like a dog. Um, next slide. Um, and so you go through that training process using a, a, a set of labeled photos. And then once the training process is done, then you can give your neural network a random photo like this one and then have it take its best guess as to whether or not that's a cat or a dog. Um, so our setup is, uh, sort of similar to this, except instead of training the neural network on cats or dogs, we're training it on um, samples of stars that would be known to be born uh, outside of the Milky Way in some satellite galaxy versus stars that would be born in the Milky Way disk. Um, the only reason that we have a shot at being able to actually do this is that we need, we actually have good training sets. Um, because simulations have actually been getting um, a lot better at reproducing galaxies that look similar to the Milky Way. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is uh, a result uh, essentially uh, illustrating this. So on the bottom is the actual data from Gaia, and on the top is um, a mock galaxy. Um, that's generated from simulation. So it's essentially given some simulation of a Milky Way-like galaxy, a mock Gaia data set is generated from that. It looks like the top panel. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of features that are similar between the mock galaxy and the real data. Um, in particular, you're forming a stable disk. There's a lot of structure. You see areas where there's uh, you know, gas that's obscuring the light, um, other regions where you actually get a lot more light that's coming through. Um, the, the reproduction isn't exact um, by any means, but it, it's, it's pretty close. 
Um, and that at least gives us hope that if we were to use these mock galaxies as a training set um, for to build a network that can identify accreted stars, we might actually have a shot at being able to do this in the real data. Next slide. So the this is the procedure we used for, for training the network. We start with the simulated uh, Ananka galaxy. Um, we train the network on stars in one part of that galaxy, um, and then we essentially apply it to the real Milky Way data uh, near the solar position. Um, and the network at that point, because of its, its training, um, is essentially going to spit out um, a prediction for each star and with a uh, essentially a probability of whether or not that star was born in the Milky Way disk or whether or not it came in from uh, a merger. Uh, now, there's a lot of ways that this kind of procedure could go wrong. And I'll be, like, when we first started working on this, I, I actually just didn't think it was going to, to work. So um, we, we went through a very long process of um, you know, over a year of essentially testing this uh, on simulated Milky Way-like galaxies to make sure that we understood the biases in this procedure. Um, just to kind of quickly give you a sense of how we did that, um, you know, we initially started with the simulated galaxy and we um, essentially trained the network on a subset of stars um, that were near the one particular solar position. And then because we knew the truth information because it was a simulated galaxy, we could see how well we did at sort of predicting um, the, the accreted versus not accreted label in that particular location of the galaxy. Uh, once that was successful, then what we did was we um, trained the network on a different part of the simulated galaxy and um, saw how well it did at predicting um, the, uh, the label in a separate. So we sort of the training and the testing set were in a different part of the galaxy. Um, that also worked well. Um, you would still be concerned though that the network is learning something very specific about the merger history of the simulated galaxy. So in order to, to, to deal with that concern, what we did was we tried um, training the network on one simulated galaxy and testing it on a very, very different simulated galaxy. Um, and it also worked very well in that case. And it was that test that gave us confidence that uh, we would be able to effectively um, take this and, and actually use it on, on the data. Uh, next slide. So I'll now just go through and uh, walk you through the results that we got from, from, from doing this analysis, because um, it sort of sheds light on exactly where we are in terms of our understanding of the, the local uh, dark matter distribution. Um, so by running the neural network on the Gaia data, what we end up getting is a catalog of all of the local stars that the network predicts with high confidence to have come from another um, uh, merger satellite. And the, those stars that uh, the network predicts with high confidence to, to be accreted are shown by the density histogram in these three panels here. Um, and there's essentially three separate contributions that are feeding into this. And I'll walk you through this now. So the, the first contribution is indicated by the pale pink circle um, and it's labeled halo. Those are, as you can see in each of these velocity um, panels, it's almost a perfect circle. Um, so this would be the stars that would have come in from very, very old, the oldest mergers. Um, so they would have had enough time to come into equilibrium and um, we see them as sort of having this isotropic velocity distribution today. So that tells us that there is some fraction of dark matter um, near the sun that would have come in from luminous galaxies that merged in before redshift three. So we know that that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, the second uh, component that's important is circled in blue. Um, that's coming from a merger that was identified in the literature. If you go to the next slide, um, in some papers it's referred to as Gaia sausage. In other papers, it's referred to as Gaia enceladus. Um, so some other papers refer to it as Gaia sausage enceladus. So that's what I'll be referring to it as the rest of the talk, so GSE. Um, the reason it's referred to as a sausage is that because it has a sort of elongated shape in the radial velocity direction. Um, next slide. 
So this was going to be a movie. showing, uh, sort of proposing how that uh, GSC merger would have taken place. So the, um, so we'll just skip that for now. Um, but the identification of GSC, which was made in some of the first papers that came out of, uh, from Gaia Data Release 2 by Bela Kurov and then also by, by Helmi et al. Um, next slide. Uh, was was a really important step in understanding the local Milky Way's family tree because it uh, immediately ended up pinning down what what is likely to be the last major merger uh, that built up our galaxy. Next slide. So we've gone from like really not knowing what what happened in this uh, evolution to all of a sudden having pinned things down to um, a period roughly seven. Uh, that's a definitely a tilde, it can range from like eight to 10 billion years ago, um, where a fairly massive system, this GSE galaxy, um, collided with our own and then got completely disrupted. Um, so it, it turns out that, uh, you know, eight to 10 billion years, giga years is, is roughly, uh, it's not enough time for all of this material to have fully equilibrated by today but it's also um, long enough that the material would be fully phase mixed and that we only really see it in um, its velocity properties. Uh, next slide. So the, the nice part of that is uh, for this GSE merger, then we, we believe that it probably came from one of, uh, you know, when we look at in simulation, that sort of corresponding mergers, this is precisely the class where the stellar tracers follow the dark matter distribution pretty closely. So we can go in and do careful measurements of velocity distributions for the stars that came from GSE and, um, and then infer from that that the you know, GSE probably dumped a bunch of dark matter that, that followed that same um, uh, velocity with the same set of velocities. Um, and so th these are just um, images, uh, uh, plots um, in radial, phi, and theta velocities in spherical galactocentric coordinates um, of the, the Enceladus stars are shown and dotted blue. Um, and so we believe, based off of what we've been learning from simulation, that the, the dark matter from this Gaia sausage Enceladus would probably be following a similar kind of velocity um, pattern. Um, next slide. So we can then go through an exercise of, of starting to actually build up a model for the dark matter near the sun that would have come from luminous galaxies. Um, this is um, actually a, a pretty complicated extrapolation procedure to get these uh, fractions correctly. So I'm happy to answer any questions about it afterwards. Um, I'll just sort of uh, summarize the results. Um, from the data, from the Gaia data, we can look at sort of the fraction of these GSE stars uh, near the solar position. So there's about 60% there in, in GSE and uh, about 40% that are coming from these old, really old mergers. Um, and then based off of that, we can extrapolate to the dark matter that about 60% of the local dark matter would be coming from the really old mergers and about 40% from GSE. So this is already telling us something about uh, how to then build up and understand uh, how that dark matter velocity distribution should be looking like uh, near the sun. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there's one other piece here that I just wanted to talk about before concluding. Um, it's the, the blob that's in green. Um, <coughs> so this was something that, um, hadn't been identified before. And so we saw it for the first time looking at this accreted stellar um, catalog. Uh, and it, it's curious because it has a, a very high radial velocity um, and it's also prograde. So it's it's moving, um, essentially moving with the disk, but uh, a little bit slower than the, the circular velocity of the disk. Um, next slide. 
So we refer to this, uh, this clump of stars as uh, the Nix stream. There's a lot of them that are in this. It's about 200 stars. Um, and they have very coherent velocities, which you can see in this image here. So these are just uh, the locations of the stars in X, Y, and Z. The sun is indicated by the yellow star in the middle. And um, the arrows show the velocity for each of these stars. And uh, you, know, you even just see by eye that it's very coherent. Um, their orbits are very eccentric. And, uh, um, and like I said earlier, they, they rotate a little bit more slowly than actual disk stars. Next slide. So there's an open question now on what the origin of that Nix stream is. And it's, it's very complicated trying to figure this out because Nix is essentially embedded within the disk. And um, the, essentially the big question is, is it actually a stream that came from a dwarf galaxy or is it some kind of perturbation to the stellar disk um, in the Milky Way? And the one way to sort of be able to distinguish these two cases is by looking at the spectroscopy of stars that would belong to Nix. So looking at their chemical compositions. And when we first wrote this paper, there weren't that many stars in the Nix subset for which we had a large uh, amount of spectroscopy for. Um, so that made it hard to distinguish. Um, that is rapidly changing, which is great, because I think this is going to be sort of the key in understanding um, the origin of this next stream. Um, I've highlighted here some work that's ongoing by Alex G and Lena Nassib. Um, they did some dedicated observations of Nick stars um, with the Magellan Telescope that will hopefully be coming out this year. It was um, unfortunately delayed because of the pandemic. Um, next slide. And actually, just earlier this week, there was um, a study that came out um, from the Apogee survey uh, looking at the chemical compositions of uh, a variety of different substructures in the Milky Way. And um, Nix was one of these. So there, um, the bottom most right panel shown in pink. Um, so this is showing the um, metallicity distribution of the Nix stars. Um, so iron over hydrogen is on the X axis and on the Y axis is magnesium over iron. And um, just to kind of give you a sense, the background, which is in uh, gray and black, is an expectation of um, where the uh, uh, in situ disk stars uh, should be. Um, and so from this sort of initial uh, work, it, it does seem like Nix might be coming from um, the high alpha um, stellar disk, but it has a very significant tail that goes down to low metallicities. Um, and uh, painting a picture that makes th these results consistent with the um, unusual kinematics of Nix, um, I think still requires some more work to, to understand uh, more fully. Uh, next slide. And um, since I'm running out of time, I won't go through this in detail, but just to say that we had, uh, we've looked in simulations to see if we could find uh, structures that are similar to Nix. Um, and we do see them there, and they come from dwarf galaxies. Uh, and so one of the things that we're uh, working on now is sort of digging into these simulations and really kind of understanding um, exactly, you know, if it is coming from a dwarf galaxy, like what, you know, what would that kind of structure look like? Is it consistent with what we're seeing in the data? If, um, you know, can those dwarf galaxies be creating a perturbation in the thick disk? And maybe that's what we're seeing in Nix. So this is just meant to, to just highlight the fact that there's sort of a big open question, I think, on what's uh, going on here. And um, with further spectroscopy studies and also like looking more into the simulation, we'll hopefully be able to clarify this better moving forward. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just meant to kind of summarize where we're at now in understanding the contributions of the local dark matter um, coming from uh, luminous satellite galaxies. Uh, from the Gaia data, we do see that there is a component of the dark matter in the sun that would have come from very old mergers. Um, so galaxies that would have come into the Milky Way before Redshift 3. Um, there is a significant amount of the dark matter near the sun that is coming from this GSE merger. Um, so this, the, the last major, uh, it's referred to often as probably being the last major merger for the Milky Way. And um, possibly, uh, uh, Nix, if Nix is coming from a dwarf galaxy, if Nix is not coming from a dwarf galaxy, then it wouldn't be contributing. So that's still a big question mark um, that we need to sort out. Um, but already understanding this old Halo Plus GSE piece is a big step 
uh, forward. Um, if, if it was only the old Halo piece, um, then the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is a good model. Uh, but now that we know that GSE is contributing dark matter near the sun, um, we know that that Maxwell Boltzmann model is not uh, fully correct and that there's additional contributions, at the very least, the contribution coming from the GSE. Um, next slide. So I had a few slides here um, just talking about work in progress. Um, since I'm already running late since we started with some delay because of the technical difficulties, I'll probably just stop here, but just um, let me just share a few words on um, kind of where we're taking this. Um, because we've learned now um, that there is a significant contribution coming from this GSE merger to the local dark matter, uh, we definitely want to understand um, the properties of that much better and try to even improve the modeling of the velocities of the dark matter that would be expected to come from the GSE merger. Um, so there's a few avenues um, in my research group um, that are trying to answer this question. One avenue is trying to figure out whether or not we can analyze a larger fraction of the Gaia data um, to find more candidate GSE stars. Uh, the goal of that would be to um, essentially uh, remove statistical uncertainty and like build a better model of the velocity distribution of the local GSE stars. And then the second piece um, is actually running dedicated simulations of GSE type mergers um, to really identify the properties of the GSE galaxy. So its original mass, its original um, infall time, uh, its orbital properties. Um, that's really key if we want to make sure that we definitely understand the dark matter that would have come from the GSE and the properties of that dark matter today. Um, and getting these simulations right is really tricky because the GSE merger is um, quite significant. It was a, it's a major merger of the Milky Way. Um, so as it was falling in, it, it was perturbing the Milky Way stellar disk. It was causing it to tilt and precess. Um, and all of that behavior needs to be properly accounted for if we want to make sure that our predictions for the dark matter debris from GSE are spot on. Um, so uh, we also have some ongoing work uh, that's trying to, to get that um, in place. Um, so I'll skip the next few slides, um, which is just sort of going into more detail on this. And then I'll conclude. I think it's like three slides that I'll skip here. Yeah, so I'll just conclude now. Um, so I've titled this Dark Matter Halo version 2.0. So version 1.0 was the um, original standard Halo model that was posited in the 1980s and that has sort of been used consistently over the ensuing 30 or so years. Um, but with improvements in uh, the sort of rapid and incredible improvements being made on the simulation front in um, simulating galaxies like the Milky Way, um, as well as the improvements on the data front, um, you know, with Gaia and also many of the other uh, um, missions that are that are coming up, we have the opportunity now to kind of revisit that halo um, that halo model. And um, the key piece here is really being able to learn something about the merger history of the Milky Way. Um, we do that by looking at substructure in in the stellar phase space, um, and then associating, um, sort of taking that and doing a mapping to the dark matter that would have come from those mergers. And doing that correlation relies on um, using um, these uh, uh, numerical simulations that exist. Um, but we've been learning a lot from that. And uh, so then by combining what we're learning from the simulations with what we're learning from the data, we're actually able to build up an empirical model of the local dark matter. Um, and so we've been making um, progress on that. We're certainly um, not done. And uh, you know, so we have definitely a lot of work ahead of us for the, the next few years. But um, I think given both the, um, uh, given the, the sort of data that's coming online, uh, we really have an exciting opportunity to really, uh, to get this uh, nailed down. Um, so hopefully there'll be more updates in the coming years on, on that as the model continues to improve. Um, so I'll, I'll end here. Um, since we're already, we were running a bit late and I'm happy to take any questions if there's any.